just place. And um, I, I'm honored that you're here, first off. So thank you, um, thank yourselves for coming here. And I know $50 is kind of a lot to ask for a house party, but you guys did it because you guys care. I appreciate you all a lot. Uh, it means a lot to me. Um, to give you a little bit of background, the reason why I wanted to bring the Shower of Hope here, um, anybody who knows me really well, like they know that I've been an activist and a volunteer for many years now. In fact, um, that dates back to 2014 when I met Mel. At the time, he uh, operated an organization called Monday Night Mission, and we were going down on a skid row, and we were handing out uh, sandwiches and water to you know the unhoused population down on skid row. And um, it wasn't easy work. Uh, it was hard, but uh, Mel was able to organize this this mission Monday through Friday. Like literally, he was doing it five days a week, uh, organizing it, fundraising, gathering food, packing sandwiches. He had an army of volunteers, many of which are still great friends of mine today, who are here. Many of them are actually here in the audience today. Um, I would not be the person I am today without Mel and learning what we did and observing what happened down on Skid Row, and. I would like tonight to kind of recreate one of the things that we did with Monday Night Mission. Like, not only did we go down there and we handed out sandwiches, but every single night we would come back and rather than just go home and like pat yourselves on the back and like, oh, okay, good job, good night, all right, we actually would have a kind of a, a round table of discussion. Whether you are a new volunteer, especially if you're a new volunteer, but you, whether you're a new volunteer or old volunteer, we would always kind of come back decompress, do a post-mortem, and we would talk about, okay, what did we see on Skid Row? What can we do? What are your feelings? Like, how do we change? Like, you know, what was your gut reaction? Like, were you scared? Were you happy? Are you proud of yourself? Were you terrified? Are you never coming back? And we were just speaking very bluntly and very openly. And I actually kind of want to do that now. Like, you know, we've got a great music lineup. We've got drinks. We've got incredible food. I don't want to make this a very long, I'm like, I'm not trying to turn this into a podcast per se. But I do want to have a very blunt and open conversation, not only about you know what's really incredible and the work that Maribel and Mel are doing with Shower of Hope now today, but I also want to have a conversation about, you know, let's be real, let's talk about the challenges that we're facing because we all see it. Like you go anywhere in LA, you see encampments everywhere. And as good as the work is that we're doing, the work is not scalable. You know, like you know, we can go out of our way to help somebody, give them the resources, give them a shower, introduce them to a counselor, get them into housing. But the amount of effort and time it takes to do that for one client, five other people have already slipped into homelessness because they can't afford rent in that same period of time. Or, you know, I'm just kind of throwing numbers out there. Um, but it's tough. And I'm not saying this to discourage anybody about what we do. It's an actually incredible work and I, I feel motivated and proud every single day to wake up and to work with both of them. But also we have to be very realistic about where our society is heading, where are our city is heading. And it's not great, it's actually very, very bleak. Um, so I'm hoping this conversation will touch on a little bit of, of that and maybe ultimately, hopefully, be a message of hope, but also a, a mess of, message of honesty. So that being said, why don't we just go ahead and kick it off and Mel, I gave you kind of the intro of like, you know, where you started with Monday Night Mission. Do you want to give a quick little background of how you pivoted to Shower of Hope and then all the different programs that you guys currently are doing? And then after that, uh, Maribel, at any point, feel free to jump in because Maribel is one of the site managers and a head, head organizer. Huh? Operations manager. Operations manager, even higher than that, sorry. Um, so yeah, I'd love to get your perspectives over, you know, what you're seeing, what, you, what you've seen since the pandemic, successes and also challenges. So that being said, so uh, <clears throat> I asked Roger to uh, do a hygiene drive for us so we could give uh, shampoo bottles and whatnot, and here we are at, uh, at a fundraiser. So thank you, Roger, for that. And not just for today, for being with us since 2014. Uh, thank you to Bennett. Thank you to John. Thank you to Wild Love, uh, Wild Love uh, Vegan Food. Thank you to. Uh, Liz, Roxy, everyone who's here, and everybody who came here to support. So, uh, and then also want to give a shout out to uh, we got my boy uh, <laughs> Brian here. We got Mia here, who are volunteers. So, uh, you know, just a quick thing on to how we started. We started on a Monday in 2011 to give out 72 sandwiches, so we called it Monday Night Mission. But it went to Monday through Friday night. So uh, we did that for seven and a half years. Five years doing that. We were like, okay, what can we do more than give a meal? And then that's where we thought, okay, 
let's get a mobile uh, mobile shower tray and see, uh, you know, we knew showers were needed, let's see how that goes. It's called the Shower of Hope, singular for a reason. It was meant to be one. Uh, we started with that. Uh, now we're at 16 mobile shower trailers. Um, while we were uh, offering people showers on the street, we noticed a lot of folks were coming in their vehicles to take a shower. So we recognized that there were a lot of people sleeping in their vehicles. So we started two programs, uh, which are safe parking programs. So they're programs for people sleeping on the street. So every night, 7 p.m., folks drive in, there's bathrooms on the lot, there's meals. Uh, we have a, a shower trailer there, we have laundry there, and uh, they, they have a safe place to park from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. And then while we were doing that, we noticed we got a couple of community college students who were in their cars, and uh, specifically Zach. Uh, Zach was uh, going to community college and he told us how tough it was to sleep in a car and study in a car. So in 2020, we started our first um, a dormitory for uh, students and how students go into community college. So we call that hope housing for students. So now uh, we have three dormitories, a total of 32 beds. We have 22 kids right now and it's 18 to 28 year olds who are going to school and we provide them everything free of charge from uh, food, utilities, uh, free mental health every week, free tutoring, free case management, clothing, anything that they need. And uh, part of what we're pivoting to right now, we, we acquired a program a couple of months ago with the mobile showers, but when we acquired that program, the staff for that program were 90% people coming from long-term incarceration. So, you know, when we were working with that, uh, uh, you know, team members were like, most of these team members are in, uh, incarcerated for 10 years or more. And as much as LA says, oh, we're gonna give people a chance, there's no chance if you have anything on your record. So what we're doing now is we're pivoting to a model where we are gonna give absolute first priority to people who are incarcerated. So the last five folks that we uh, hired are still on parole. So, uh, and we're gonna continue that and it looks like we are gonna have a chance to expand this program and we're gonna open it up to folks who uh, are gonna, uh, are, are not gonna be hired anywhere else then we're gonna give them a home, we're gonna give them income, we're gonna give them uh, hope. Yeah. Woo! Woo! Yeah. Woo! Um, I, I just wanna to add to that, they, they are offering a living wage. You know, it is, it, it, it's higher than minimum wage, which is incredible, unto itself. I mean, you're already better than 95% of corporations out there. Just on that amount. $90 an hour. Yeah. That's our lowest, lowest wage across the organization, including interns, is $19 an hour. And to add to that, we've also for a long time have hired from our unhoused community because we know that it's hard for them to get a job as well since they don't have a place to live, they don't have a place to really rest and be prepared for a job. So if they do get a job, they end up losing it because they're always tired, they're always scared, they're always worried. If I go to this job, is someone going to steal everything from my tenants? And if I don't have a place to shower, if I'm not properly fed, I'm just at work thinking about I'm hungry, I'm dirty, I'm this, and they'll end up losing whatever job they can acquire. So Mel saw that need and we've for a long time been hiring from our unhoused community as well. Okay. Okay. Um, one thing I want to add, like a, a lot of people here I know from the world of um, just festivals, partying, electronic music, raves, burning man. You know Burning Man, right? You know how dirty you feel if you have not had a shower in 48 hours. You feel haggard. And imagine how you feel when you actually finally take that shower. You feel completely renewed. You feel like, hey, I, I'm a human being again. I actually have my wits together. Let's, let's handle it. Let's, let's start my day. Let's go do something epic. Uh, imagine somebody living on the streets not having access to a bathroom. And especially during COVID because uh, a lot of people in the unhoused community, you know, they take advantage of like, you know, public restrooms, you know, restaurants, whatever. And, you know, a lot of those man managers obviously hate that or whatever, but sometimes that's a different story. What I'm saying though is like during COVID, if you can imagine all those restaurants, all those like convenience stores, everything shut down. So the need to actually have facilities to take a shower was like a hundredfold. Like, I mean, it, it was like a matter of literally life and death or, you know, mental health versus like uh, mental unhealth, you know, no doubt. So. Um, just try to relate in your own head the nastiest, funkiest feeling you've ever had living in a tent, you know, at, at a music festival and just a hundredfold, that's what it's like living 
in a sense, you know, like 24 uh, 7. So if you can relate to that at all. I know that's a, a weird analogy, but Bernie Mac. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, just like you were saying, how we were able to take a shower every day because hopefully all of us are housed and we're able to shower every day. And even though we shower every day after work, after school, after going out and playing with the kids, I was uh, all day this afternoon at my kid's soccer game running back and forth with him and being able to get home and shower even though I shower every single day. It just helped me decompress so much. And I have that every single day. So I can't imagine the feeling. I've seen it. I can never be in their shoes. And I can never get the exact feeling that they get. But I see they go in. Some of them are grumpy. Some of them are screaming, even cursing us out. They come out completely new person. Completely new person. Sometimes they even apologize to us. I was having a bad day. But now, like, after that nice, cool shower and everything you guys gave me and everything, the resources you guys had at us, I'm so sorry that I cursed you out, that I threw something at you or whatever. And it's just a complete change, you know? And then we we always hook up with other organizations, you know, have a COVID testing, vaccine, housing, stuff like that. And the same thing, you come in, you're already in a bad mood, someone's trying to talk to you about housing, you don't want to hear it. But you go and take a shower, relax, decompress, you come out, you're like, you know what? I think I do want to hear about that. What kind of resources do you have for me? You know what? I changed my mind. I think I'll get that COVID vaccine. So it just, it helps a lot. It's it's hard for us to really imagine it since thankfully we all have a place to shower and try to shower on a daily basis. But for them, it just make you think it's just a shower. It's just a shower. It's not housing that we're getting them, just a shower. But we've seen the difference that it makes and it's amazing. Cool. Now, um, I kind of want to pivot a little bit and just talk about challenges too, because Again, you guys are doing incredible work and you know, you're touching all these different um, aspects of um, the unhoused community, whether it's students or uh, people living in their cars or um, what have you. But you know, for somebody from the outside who's not part of this world, who doesn't do volunteer work, organizing, activism, mutual aid, anything like that, they're just driving around LA and they just see tents everywhere. Maybe a, a tent encampment popped up in their own neighborhood and they're terrified and they're scared and they don't know what to do and they're frustrated and they're angry. and. I, I think it's very easy to, you know, blame politicians or blame a certain political party or blame, you know, progressives or anything like that. And I just want to know, like, how, how do you guys combat this, the nimbyism or whatever? I mean, what, what is it that you would want to tell somebody who's outside of this issue? How do you even, like, win over their compassion? And what can we do to move forward to improve this whole situation? Because I know the, the overall solution is so much bigger than the Shower of Hope. I mean, it's systemic you know so what would you guys say to any of that well i'm i'm gonna get a little personal because this is actually something that i do on probably a weekly basis but i live in azusa um azusa glendora san dimas is a pretty conservative area so um i go out and you know people will ask me what i do or what well Sorry, but I go bar hopping <laughs> to like little hole in the wall bars. You know, you get all the old cranky people there. They see a gr young girl by herself there. They start talking and asking what I do. So I told them I work with our unhoused community right away. You get all the judgments, you know, like, oh, those lazy people are drinking this and that, whatever. So I have a seven year old autistic child. He is thankfully high functioning. Um, as best a job as I can do, as his school system could do, as his counseling, speech therapist. I don't know if he's gonna be able to function in society. Once he's older, can he get a job, maintain it? Is he gonna be able to socially get along with everyone and deal with everyday problems and everything? And I hope to be there as long as I can to help him through that, but there's a lot of kids that grow up with a lot of disorders and they don't have the support that my child has. And that's what we see a lot out there in our guests. It's people that have this mental disabilities and that have issues like that. And no, they're not all drunk. They're not all lazy. With the proper help or proper upbringing, if they would have had caring and loving parents, they could have probably succeeded and wouldn't have fallen to the cracks and been in the position they're in now. But a lot of them, it's that, you know? And I always try to educate, you know, the people that I fight with. And, um, you know, let them know, like, hey, do you have a kid that has Down syndrome, that has autism? Oh, wait, yeah, my, 
my cousin's kid has autism and yeah, he doesn't seem like all there. And I'm like, okay, well imagine like, I don't know, maybe your cousins are caring parents, but what if that kid didn't have caring parents and didn't care and didn't give him the proper help. And as an adult, he couldn't hold a job together because no one taught him responsibility. No one taught him anything. And now he falls through the cracks of, of the system. And now he's living on the streets because he doesn't know how to function in society. Because autism, their main thing is, you know, they're socially awkward. They don't they have social issues, you know? And that's a big part of our society. It's holding a job and trying to get a job and anything, it's being social. And if they can't do that and they never had the proper support, well, you know, we know a lot of people, I mean, me as Mexican, my parents never believed in like medicine, medicating. So I had ADHD. I know probably if it was diagnosed as often as it is now back then, I probably am on the spectrum as well. But parents didn't believe in that. No, you're not going to get medication. No, you're just tough it out, tough it out. A lot of people were brought like that, but a lot of people were lower on the spectrum and couldn't function and couldn't just tough it out. They fell through the cracks. And that's who the majority of our guests are. It's not drunks, it's not people that don't wanna get a job, you know? It's people that if they had the proper upbringing, love and support and resources that some of us had, they would have probably made it, you know? But. Thank you for sharing, I appreciate that. I, I yeah. wanna. Yeah. 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 I do want to add that over the course of, you know, the eight or nine years that I've been doing this, one thing that I've observed too is like, you know, when we did, went down to Skid Row, like when we saw the unhoused population down there, like we kind of knew, oh, okay, you know, this person is struggling, you know, maybe they've had mental health issues or something like that, addiction, you know, maybe their entire lives. But I have noticed that over the years, as our homeless population has kind of exploded, the type of people that I meet now that need the services of the Shower of Hope don't fit your typical stereotypes, you know, like in the um, safe parking programs that you guys have done, uh, you know, a lot of it might be domestic abuse, you know, like a, a really bad relationship and, you know, somebody thrown out on the street or a, a lot of medical bankruptcy, a lot of medical bankruptcy. It, it's ridiculous. Like, you know, people fighting cancer and stuff. Somebody had a bad heart condition or, you know, a, a spouse passed away or something like that. It, um, you would be shocked at the type of people that are slipping through the cracks and are living on the street now. And it is so much bigger than, oh, that drug addict, oh, that lazy person, oh, that career criminal. It, throw that out the window. Um, but that being said, though, um, you know, there, there is a dangerous element, too. I'm not going to say it's all roses and, you know, daisies and things like that. I mean, there are some people who are driven to, you know, extreme dangerous lifestyles because drug addiction is a, a big part of the unhoused community too and you know um somebody had kind of described the situation to me as in um it, what does a meal cost right if you're trying to go to a restaurant and you're trying to get fed you know a, a meal any meal even a cheap meal 12 bucks 15 dollars something like that what is a hit of crack what what, what is um an oxycontin pill or what what is you know all these other you know things that can suppress your diet or you know just make you have a, a brief moment of escapism it's five dollars ten dollars you know like so and then also a lot of people who are struggling and need medication sometimes they self-medicate because like okay if you don't have a health insurance policy and you're fighting the demons and you're just you're down you know that pill that that joint whatever that might be that can take the edge off and that's cheap. That's really cheap and that's that's a problem. Addiction is a huge, huge issue, you know, with the unhoused community. And sometimes it used to be like, oh, you're unhoused because you're an addict. Nowadays, it can also be the reverse is just as true where you're an ad addict because you're unhoused, because you're trying to escape the horrors of living on the street. So I don't know if you want to have any um, anything to add to that, but... Um, I, for people who are kind of worried about their safety or the increase of crime, or how do you even interact with somebody who you know you feel like might be having a bad episode or might be an addict, you know we know that they need love too, but how do you, how do you deal with that? I, I think that's a that's sort of a good question because the truth is right now I'm not talking about the house community. I'm talking about the community at whole in the U.S. is going through a huge issue with uh, addiction. Uh, the drugs available now from uh, the potency of the meth available to fentanyl to nitazines is like probably uh, one of five times more available than two years ago and then also probably 20 to 30 times more harder to uh, quit than before. 
and and it is again it is throughout you know the throughout the whole US that we're seeing and we're seeing kids as young as 11 12 years old trying these drugs so first thing i think we really need to have a discussion around it and and second we also have to understand a lot of the the folks who fall prey to these they end up homeless because of that addiction so what what do we do to one recognize it and two what do we do and and i think one of the things is like you know Roger can uh attest to this you know we we started doing this in 2011 and uh, we we've, we've been involved in advocacy since 2013 in 2013 was when uh you know Mitch O'Farrell said he wanted to ban feeding the homeless in LA and that's when we were like okay we're not just gonna serve food we're gonna start uh you know we're gonna start pushing legislation too so that's when we had our first protest but I think one of the things that's really important is there's a lot of narratives and we tend to go with narratives the, the thing with homelessness is this homelessness is, uh, you know, the result of multiple causes. If we stick to a narrative, we're probably going to uh, not help 70% of the folks who are, uh, you know, uh, unhoused because of those certain issues. Some issues work for others and that same solution will not work for another person. Don't get involved in a narrative because the second you think one narrative, no matter how good it is, is going to work then you're in the wrong so the thing is you know for folks like when you ask how do you want to get involved one you know go talk to folks right that's the first thing go talk to folks now some of these folks you're gonna just like any friend you met you're gonna see it's easy to build a relationship when you build that relationship if you really want to help try to see how you can further them in their journey out of homelessness where they'd be helping them get a driver's license, where they'd be helping refer them into a program, where they'd be help them, uh, you know, uh, replace a birth certificate. But if you can be an advocate for one person, that is going to help that one person get out of homelessness. But that is also going to help you understand how the system works, what's broken, and what works. So one of the main things is don't stick to a narrative, no matter how good it is, no matter who says it, if you think one narrative is gonna bring us out of homelessness, it's not gonna work. All right, um, I, 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 thank you for that. I guess to wrap things up before we get back to great music and great food, I, I wanna ask this to both of you. Um, you know, your program is called The Shower of Hope and um, you guys are warriors and you wake up every single day dedicated to this mission. Where is your hope coming from? What what keeps you going? Um, no been a single day that I had to address this situation by myself. For Monday night mission, like, you know, first day, I, you know, we had four volunteers. And then, you know, you joined in. And then, you know, Laurie, Laurie over there, Laurie went with us to march to uh, Sacramento in 2015. We went to Sacramento to ask money because... Uh, back then in 2015, the city of LA budget on homelessness was only 34 million. And, uh, you know, within within that time, we have so many people. We have Brian here. We have so many other, Leslie left, so many volunteers who joined in that we never, 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 like, ha ever walked this alone to understand that there's other people who share the same vision of helping other folks. So as long as there's other people who are willing to help, that's all. Love our volunteers, but my my hope all comes from my child. I mean, the the beam in his eye from knowing what we do. So on Sundays, usually um, I'll drive because the I'm his I'm a city parent, but um, on Sundays when I drive around to the sites to drop off supplies, I take him with me. And he knows all of our team members, and he knows what we do, and he knows our team members that are in house. And we'll be like, why can't we just help them get housing? Let's just get them a house. And just how proud he is of what we do, and that we're actually out there trying to help. And that's all he thinks of. Like, well, I have my little piggy bank, and um, can we help them with that? And it's just amazing. Like, there's no amount of money, no amount of anything that will ever, ever, ever substitute that, you know? And being that example for him and knowing that when he grows up, he is heading in the same direction. He's gonna want to help. He's not gonna be there to judge people or anything. He's gonna be there like, okay, you have a problem? How can I help you? What can I do? And everybody is our friend, you know? You don't just help your family because they're family. You don't just help the people that you know. 
you help everyone. Everyone's your friend. We're all in this together. All of our amazing volunteers, donors, people that share our stuff, all of you guys that are here, we're all in this together. Everyone, even the people that don't believe in this, you know? We, just because they don't believe in this, they don't believe in what we're doing, they have a different opinion, we're not gonna turn our backs on them. If they need help, we're gonna be there for them, you know? So all, that's, that's where my hope comes from. Thank you so much. Well, um, if you guys want to continue learning more about the organization, obviously follow the Shower Club on uh, you know social media, like them on Facebook, um, and also talk to them. Talk to them tonight. You know, you guys are sticking around for a little bit, maybe. Uh, well, maybe. Uh, or uh, I can make the introduction for you, or come out and volunteer anytime. Anybody here wants to volunteer at a Shower Club site, I'll come join you. Let's go do it. And, and then quickly, like you know. All of you guys came here, you know, to this new program that Roger started because you wanted to help. So thank you to everybody who came. Thank you to everybody who volunteered that time to help. And, you know, just thank you for having hope yourselves that we can always work together and do better. So thank you for each and every one of you. Yeah.